tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about this and our other weekly storytelling programs. And become a patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. The darkness has found you. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 3. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. Join me for not one, but two stories. Just like old times, I guess. This evening, we have How to Be Perfect by Corpse Child and The Winds of Mars by Kyle Harrison. So many tales so little time. Shall we dive right in? I think we shall. Shall we? And now something you've never heard before. You are listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. And now, from author Corpse Child, I give you How to Be Perfect. Let me ask you something. Do you feel like a failure? Do you feel like you're nothing but a walking sack of flaws held by a sack of meat? Do you wish you could change it? If so, how would you do it? Would you try changing your dietary habits? Eat less junk food, eat more veggies, etc.? Maybe try exercising more or hitting the gym three times a week, right? Maybe you'll finally ask out that super hot co-worker that has you tongue-tied every time you try to talk to her. Oh, I know. You'll try turning to faith to seek out some higher form of encouragement now, won't you? Let me guess, though. You've tried most, if not all, of the aforementioned methods, haven't you? You've done what the hippies and the shrinks have spouted at you, and you still feel like you have no place in this God-forsaken world. Right? I'll bet you'd sell your soul 
just to feel like you mean something in this life, wouldn't you? I bet you wish you could be perfect. What if you could be? Now, before you accuse me of blowing smoke, hear me out. Yes, there is a way for you and I, human beings, to be perfect. Just imagine it for a second. You could live for the rest of your life without flaws. No, you live unable to create flaws. You'd never make any mistakes. You'd never hurt anybody. You'd always be able to finish what you start, and best of all, you will never fail at anything again. Sounds great, right? I'll bet it sounds too good to be true to you, doesn't it? I can practically hear your next words coming a mile away. How in the hell am I supposed to make myself perfect? Well, if you really are that desperate to know, I can tell you how. Don't ask me right now how I know about what I'm about to tell you. I'll get to that later. In all honesty, it's all something I, myself, am still trying to comprehend. For now, if you're still serious about this, here's how to begin. A quick history lesson on this is that the game, or ritual itself, is called the Ritual of the Damned Lamb. It was apparently used by various lesser-known, unnamed, and underground religious societies and or cults in older times, usually as a way of ascension, or for seeking some divine forgiveness for trespassing in some way to the faith. Only very, very, very few individuals today from those faiths are still around, and might would still use this practice today. I say all of this to say that there's essentially a prerequisite for attempting this. You have to believe in something. It doesn't have to be Christianity, <laughs> obviously, given that the religions that practice this weren't exactly what most would consider to be Christians themselves. You could be Christian, Catholic, Buddhist, Muslim, Wiccan or even some made-up religious belief like Heaven's Gate, just as long as you believe in the existence of some higher power. You're set to begin this practice. And here's what you'll need. Sticks or twigs. An empty room, or at least a length and width of six to eight feet of open floor space. A blade or object sharp enough to draw blood. A blindfold of some sort. To begin, take the sticks or twigs you've gathered and place them into your empty space, forming them into the shape of whatever symbol or talisman represents your personal faith or beliefs. You'll need to make the symbol large enough to lie down on top of, so the number of sticks will vary according to the shape and size of the symbol. Next, remove all clothing, and, using your sharp object... Pierce the palms of your hands and smear your blood at the point where your hands, head, and feet would be. Now, lie down inside the shape of your symbol and put on your blindfold. Make sure your blindfold is on tight, painfully tight, if you need to. You should be able to see nothing but complete darkness throughout for this to work. Lastly, Take your sharp object and carve an X into the center of your chest and whisper, In the names of those that stand beyond our veil, I offer unto thee my blood, my flesh, and my mind for sale. Take it, for I am thy damned lamb, and grant me perfection that I may never again fail. Now, lay calmly and still inside your symbol. Good. Eventually, you'll start to feel a stinging sensation, 
like you're being poked with a bunch of hot needles or shards of glass in your chest. Keep calm. Lie still. Trust me, movement will only make it hurt worse. You should start hearing multiple faint whispers circling simultaneously around in your mind. They'll each be in a different language and different tones. Some will just whisper, like it's trying to tell you a secret. While others will scream to you, like they're in pain. Again, stay calm. And try to listen to each word being said. You should start to hear the words form together to create a jumbled, distorted mess of words, yet you will somehow be able to comprehend it in your own language. What exactly is said may vary, but essentially, it should be something to the effect of, I have come, my child. What doth thou seek? To this, you must answer one word. Perfection. Now you should start to feel the stabbing sensation in your hands and feet as well. Again, stay calm and still. The voice will ask your name, your age, sex, date of birth, and finally, what it is that you believe in. Answer the questions clearly and honestly. It will know if you are lying. And it will make this whole thing that much more painful for you. Now, here's where your endurance is tested. The voice will then proceed to describe moments of your life where you exhibited some imperfection or flaw. It will be described in great detail to you, essentially forcing you to relive the moment yourself. At first, it'll be something small, minute. Something you'd normally pass off, like the little white lies you used to tell your mom and dad to try and get out of trouble. Or maybe even the time you got away with sneaking off with the dollar store candy bar. Over time, however, it will start to detail more and more personal flaws or embarrassments in your life. The ones you've tried to keep secret, as well as even the ones you've managed to repress. It will then ask you to either confess or deny what was said. Whatever it is, like before, answer truthfully. For each confession, the pain in your hands, feet, and chest will gradually become worse, eventually becoming almost unbearable. Remain calm and still and continue to answer honestly. Eventually... The described moments will have caught up to the present, and it will then ask you if you wish to be made perfect. Should you answer no, well, I can't say what would happen. Now, here's where I answered your question from before about how I know all of this. It was about a year ago to the day now that I performed this ritual. I was looking at my final days on death row, the needle waiting for me. I won't go into detail on what all I'd done, or should I say what all didn't I do, to land me there. Suffice to say, I was a very bad man who's destroyed, in many different ways, the lives of good people and I'll be the first to tell you that I deserved every bit of what was waiting for me. That was the day I was to be visited by a priest for last confessions. By that point, I'd already been long past the state of mind or heart to care about clearing my conscience. I'd already confessed to everything in the courtroom what good was it going to do me to repeat myself to some random pious moron now? The way I saw it, my place in hell was booked and reserved, and nothing was going to change that. I remember when he first walked up to my cell, 
He was a middle-aged man wearing a black trench coat and hat like he was the exorcist or something, and his face was pale and gaunt. Tell the truth, I almost thought I'd finally lost my mind, and I was now seeing ghosts or something when I saw him at first. For a while, he just stared at me with the coldest, deadest eyes I'd ever seen outside of a Vietnam vet. Well... I said, annoyed. Either spout your scriptures or shove off. I've already confessed everything and I'm screwed no matter what I say or do now, so unless the miracle you're about to run your mouth about is that you're holding a pardon for the governor, please, just spare me. He just continued staring daggers at me, and I was tempted to do something to cause a disruption just to make him leave. I am here, he said in a cracked yet baritone voice. To offer you salvation, Mr. Keller. I looked at him again like he was insane before chuckling dryly. Despite this, he just kept on staring at me. You serious? I asked in disbelief. Salvation? What do you think you're going to get me? To give my heart to Jesus or some shit like that? Look, I stopped buying into all that crap long ago. Trust me, there is no saving my soul. He stood motionless and silent. I could see from the look on his face that, in his mind at least, he wasn't kidding about whatever he was talking about. That said, what the hell was that supposed to mean? Offering me salvation? He took a deep breath and spoke again. Perhaps I should rephrase. I'm here, Mr. Keller, to offer you the opportunity for perfection. Now, I really was confused. Huh? What are you talking about now? A chance at perfection? What's that supposed to mean? He was silent again. Well? I urged, quickly feeling my patience leave me. Exactly what I said, Mr. Keller. I'm here to offer you a chance at becoming perfect. No more pain. No more flaws. None of the wickedness in your heart. You should never do any wrong again. I was lost for words. Normally, by this point, I'd have either stopped listening and ignored them until they went away, or I'd have told them exactly where they could cram it and made them leave. This time, though, something was different. For one thing, he said all of this with the most dire conviction. In most cases, I can tell when they're trying to just spout their usual jab around at me about the gospel, but this... This wasn't that, though. After all, he clarified that he was offering me perfection instead of the Lord's mercy or some shit like that. Despite this, that still didn't completely convince me that this was legit. What does he mean by becoming perfect? What do you allow me to enter and I can show you what I am talking about? Now I was convinced this guy popped a few screws loose. (laughs) Right. Let you in my cell. Like they'd even allow that. Oh, you're funny, pal. He sighed and looked down before saying he'd be back again tomorrow. Use the time you have left wisely, Mr. Keller, was the last thing he said to me before turning and leaving the block, sauntering down the hallway like some supervillain in a movie. That night, I couldn't sleep, tossing and turning. Wondering who in the name of God this crackpot was and what he was going on about. And sure enough, 
like clockwork. Come 10 a.m. the next morning, there he was. Approaching my cell in that same menacing fashion he did the previous day with a duffel bag. I was caught off guard, however, when I saw two of the guards then unlock and open the cell door, letting him in. Before I could ask if the guards themselves had lost their damn minds, he held up his hand, silencing me, and said, Just listen to me. Without any real way to argue or protest, I scoffed and gestured him to come on in. He then went on to tell me about the ritual of the damned lamb, how to perform it, and the different groups that performed it for divination and all that, as I said earlier. While he railed on, he started pulling out the aforementioned materials out of his bag. The sticks, the blade, and the blindfold. I was instantly in shock, seeing the knife. How in the hell did he manage to get that past the front, I wondered. Probably the same way he managed to convince them to even let him into my cell at all. In any case... He then asks me if I was ready to perform the ritual, to become perfect, to quote his words. Now I was the silent one. Has anyone ever even accomplished this? Well, I can't say for certain. Only they themselves would know. And where exactly are they now? I was not feeling good about any of this. He looked away from the supplies to me, fixing me in that cold, demented glare again. Again, Mr. Keller, I cannot say for certain. Those that embark on this trial do so alone. If it will answer your question, I will say that those I knew to have performed this ritual, I have not seen since. That was it. I couldn't take this ominously vague crap anymore, and I felt like this ritual, or whatever it was, was not a good idea. Okay, look, I'm not interested in whatever the hell this is, and my patience is just about gone, so I will ask you one more time to piss off and leave me alone. Like the last time, he just lowered his head and silently got up and left. I was then alone again in my cell two days from execution. Funny enough, it actually took me a minute to realize that the man had left his stuff behind in my cell. Looking back, I am certain he did this on purpose. I spent hours just looking at the materials, thinking about everything the man said about this ritual. He had to have been nuts, I thought. How would I become perfect? I still wasn't sure what he even meant when he said perfect. Perfect how? And how exactly would this make me become perfect? Not to mention the idea that none who've attempted this have ever been seen again. Another part of me, however, couldn't help but look at the stuff he left behind, wondering what perfection would be like. No more pain, no flaws. None of the wickedness in your heart. I can't lie here. I know I said that I was beyond hoping for anything other than to burn for the things I'd done, which was true. That being said, that doesn't preclude me from the weight of my conscience. That's right. Yeah. Even a fiend like me has a bit of a heart, after all. Hmm. Imagine that. I mean, yeah... It all still sounded like a load of crap, and it didn't sound like it would turn out good for anyone who did it. As far as I knew, it wasn't even possible to actually complete this ritual. And even if I did, what would even happen? Well, then again, what would I really be losing here if I did? It was with this in mind that I then began setting up everything for the ritual... Though I wasn't any devout Christian or anything like that, by any stretch of the imagination, I did believe there was a god out there. A god that would damn me as soon as he saw me. Anyway, I had set up the sticks in the form of the cross. 
and tied the blindfold around my head before carving the X in my chest and reciting the incantation. In the names of those that stand beyond our veil, I offer unto thee my blood, my flesh, and my mind for sale. Take it, for I am thy damned lamb, and grant me perfection that I may never again fail. For about five minutes, nothing was happening. I started wondering what might happen when one of the guards walks by to see all of this. Then again, how are they not already? I guess that old goat went and managed to pay them off for that, too. Soon enough, I did start to hear the whispers I mentioned before. Something else I should mention about this is how real they will sound. What I mean by this is that they won't sound like some ghostly wail, like what you're probably thinking. No, no, no. These will sound like the voices of normal people. Clear and defined. And they sound like they're nearby. It was all so soft at first, and I thought it may have been a couple of the guards whispering outside my cell. Then, though... They got louder, and louder, and I noticed how they were all in different languages. One was in Spanish, another, I think, was in German, and so on and so forth. A couple of them I'm not even sure were in any actual known language, more like some archaic tongues or something like that. Finally... They mixed together to form the words in English. I have come, my child. What doth thou seek? The voice was commanding and hypnotic in a way, despite it was also sounding half dead. My tongue was frozen for a moment before remembering what I had to say, stammering out. Perfection. Immediately, I cried out and seized in pain when I felt the stabbing in my hands and feet. The movements caused the pain to amplify. Once, I was able to force myself to lie still. I heard the voice ask me my name, age, birthday, sex, and my belief. I struggled to answer feeling the constant pain and fighting the urges to seize up again. My name is Jeremiah Keller. I... 35. Born April 6th, 1984. Male. The pain increased dramatically, feeling now like my hands and feet had been set on fire. And I heard the voice thunder in my head, asking me again what I believed in. After a moment's consideration and increasing pain, I finally blurted out, Christian! Baptist! Slowly, the burning subsided, and it went back to just feeling like my hands and feet were being stabbed. The voice then began to describe the time when I was five, and I'd used to terrorize my neighbor's cat by nailing it with my red rider. It also described how I would lie when questioned about it to get off scot-free. Finally, it asked me whether I admit my guilt or deny I remembered what the man told me about being honest and confessing to my imperfections when he told me about this, and I had a feeling that lying would make the extra pain from before return. Yes, 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 Uh, I confess! I let out a sharp yelp when the pain started erupting in the center of my chest as well as the rest. At first, I thought I was suffering from a heart attack which made me seize again, which in turn caused the pain to increase again. Next, 
The voice started telling me about the time when I was eight, and I used the pocket knife I got for my birthday to shave my little sister's head in her sleep. This caused her to have to be rushed to the ER after I dug too deep and embedded part of it in her head. She survived, but now lives with major mental disabilities, chronic narcolepsy, severe amnesia, and even has trouble trying to talk because of it. When it asked me to confess or deny this time, I was a lot more hesitant to answer. That was one of the many horrible things I'd done, and I honestly had damn near forgotten completely about until that moment. Reliving it like that, I was tempted to deny anything to get rid of the guilt again. I... I did... I I deny... That was my big mistake. Before I could even finish saying that, I felt the burning in my chest and limbs again, much worse this time. Of course, the extreme pain would cause me to seize again, and yes, this made it worse again. All right, all right, I confess, I did it! Uh, I fucking did it! God, I'm sorry! Uh. Like before, my confession caused the burning to go away immediately. There was another minute before I could relax my body again, and the voice began another scene from my life. I don't know exactly how long it went on like this, the voice forcing me to confess to wrong or imperfect parts of my life while I struggled, both from physical and emotional pain, to answer the way I was supposed to. I know that. Like I've said, it gradually started describing to me the more and more horrific things I had done over the years up to the prison. The animals I used to torture just because. The children I used to kidnap and hold for ransom. Some of which wouldn't live after I was through with them because mommy and daddy wouldn't pony up. The women I brutally tortured and raped until I could barely even breathe. All of it replayed by the voice in all their gruesome detail. And, of course, each confession caused the stabbing sensations to hurt worse and worse. Part of me wondered if this was what they meant in churches when they talk about divine judgment. In any case, I was indeed being judged here. What would result from it at that point was anybody's guess. Finally, I had confessed to my last imperfection. The murder of a man and his pregnant wife. The one that finally landed me here. My body was in so much pain by now, and I found myself wishing I had just chosen the needle. It then asked me if I wished to become perfect. I was almost too scared to answer. What would happen to me if I said no? Would the burning pains come back? Maybe it would be something that felt even worse. Then again... Maybe nothing would happen. Maybe it'll just let me go. And I'd just go back to where I was before I started all of this. I figured, though, I'd manage to make it to here. What's the point in backing out now, anyway? Whatever happens, one way or another, I'm a goner. With this, I answered yes. What happened next is still difficult to describe in a way that makes sense to you while being accurate. All at once, I felt a giant gust of frigid air blast the front of my face, and then I felt nothing. Now, when I say I felt nothing, that is exactly what I mean. Nothing. Physically, mentally, or even emotionally. 
nothing. It was as if someone had hollowed me out like a watermelon, leaving just an empty shell. Because of this, I thought that I was dead at first. I realized otherwise, however, when I could hear sounds from all around me. They were voices, not like the ones I heard before, but actual people. I could hear all of them around me, chatting, laughing, even whispering. It was all just mundane stuff, who's seeing who, who's running late, husbands telling their families I love you before heading out, stuff like that. But I heard it, and understood it all. And that wasn't all. I could hear the sounds of every single insect or animal scurrying and tittering by, all of it in painfully crystalline clarity. Slowly, I removed the blindfold from my eyes to see that I wasn't in my cell anymore. I was now in a large field of bright green grass. Looking around, I found that I could see everything as well. Every blade of grass was clear and defined to me in every detail. I saw clouds gathering overhead and they were defined too, as was the tiny, crystal clear droplets of water that fell from them. I know what you're thinking now, that I'm just on drugs or something, describing my latest trip, but no. No, this wasn't that. <laughs> Trust me. I would know the difference between a trip and reality. This, this was reality. I wasn't sure how, but it was. It was all real. I could now hear everything, see everything, understand everything. And yet, I felt nothing. Empty. I looked at my hands and my body to see that my skin was now a pure ivory. I was naked and muscular, looking like a Greek god. I looked down to see a flower at my feet that was lilting. Stooping down, I touched it and it immediately began to bloom into the most beautiful, radiant flower I had ever seen. I had the power to give life. I had the power to create. And yet still I felt nothing. Empty. I walked around the grassy plains and saw the grass and the flowers grow vibrant with every life under my feet. Eventually I found a deer who'd been wounded, presumably by hunters. Like with the flower, one light tap of my finger and its vitality was restored, darting off into the woods with more energy than ever. I could heal the sick. I could even raise the dead. Yet, I could feel absolutely nothing. Empty. I could now do nothing but good for the world. I was now essentially a god. No, not a god. I was god. I could create, never destroy. I could heal, never harm. I could bring happiness, never despair. I could do all of this. And yet I couldn't feel. I was empty. No. No, not empty. Perfect. That was when I realized exactly what I had lost when I completed the ritual. I was now God on earth, but bound as a slave to perfection. I couldn't feel anymore. All the joy and happiness I now bring to others, and yet I have none of my own. And now... I never will again. I couldn't admire the things I could do now, 
I couldn't be proud of my new ways because I couldn't feel pride. I couldn't cry for joy when I'd see the hurt be healed by me because I couldn't feel joy or tears. I couldn't be angry or hurt when I saw something or someone suffering because I couldn't feel anger or pain anymore. Or happiness. Or sadness. Or joy. Or sorrow. Or pride. Or humility. Everything. All gone. I wouldn't feel anything ever again. Empty. Perfect. As I said before, I've lived like this for two years now, devoid of any soul or humanity. I was an evil man, set to die in two days and now. I'm something else entirely. Something more. And at the same time, something less. And I will continue to live like this, a slave to perfection itself, until the end of time. For I, myself, cannot die, only live, only live. Now that I've told you all of this, let me ask you. Would you wish to be perfect? You've been listening to How to Be Perfect by Corpse Child. And now, from author Kyle Harrison, I give you... The Winds of Mars Approximately 334 days ago, according to the Martian calendar, NASA began to use the Perseverance rover for research of the Red Planet. Thanks to the rover, we have learned more about our distant neighbor this year than ever before. But not all of it is for the betterment of mankind. Two microphones aboard the rover have been recording the winds of the red planet for quite some time, trying to determine the acoustic differences between our world and Mars. Mars has an unusual atmosphere compared to this planet, with very different temperature, density, and chemistry. These differences have three main effects on the sound you'd hear. The speed of sound. Sounds emitted in the cold Martian atmosphere take slightly longer to get to your ear. With an average surface temperature around negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit, or negative 63 degrees Celsius, Mars has a lower speed of sound, around 540 miles per hour, that is 240 meters per second, compared to about 760 miles per hour or 340 meters per second, on Earth. You probably wouldn't notice up close, but over longer distances you definitely would. Imagine trying to hear the roar of a fire, only to realize that the house you were getting to had already burned down. The volume of sound. The level you hear will also be automatically lower on Mars. The Martian atmosphere is about a hundred times less dense than on Earth. That is, there's just a lot less of it. That affects how sound waves travel from the source to the detector, resulting in a softer signal. 
On Mars, you'd have to be much closer to the source of a sound to hear it at the same volume as you would on Earth. And finally, the quality of the sound. The atmosphere of Mars, which is made up of 96% carbon dioxide, absorbs a lot of higher pitch sounds, so only lower pitch sounds travel long distances. This effect is known as attenuation, a weakening of the signal at certain frequencies, and it would be more noticeable the farther you were from the source. Put together, these three impacts change how you or anything would sound in the atmosphere of Mars. Imagine then the surprise felt when it was recorded only a week ago. What sounded like screaming. I was at my station reviewing the audio and barely drifting off to the ambience that was carrying through the microphones when this extremely high-pitched shriek pierced the airwaves. Immediately, I fumbled with my gear, snatching the headphones off as I felt my heart beat faster than it ever had before. I took a moment to recompose and then placed the headphones back on to listen. The noise was gone. But it did feel like there were reverberations from it everywhere in the audio. There was this low thrill that filled the void from the shriek. Hesitantly, I rewound the audio, turning the volume to a lower frequency so it wouldn't hurt my ears. Ordinarily, to get proper analysis, we are told to not do this. But the situation was unique, and I figured that it would be easier to handle the screams if they didn't terrify me. What I heard disturbed me beyond what mere words can describe. The best way to offer an explanation would be to provide you with an anecdote from my childhood. I had a dog named Brutus when I was little, a large Labrador retriever that could hold his ground against the toughest predators out there. One time, I swear, I saw him run off a bear. This dog was loyal. He would always go with us hunting and making sure that we were protected. It was like he had eyes in the back of his head. One particular hunt, my brother and I decided to go out when it was storming and try to find a few deer that enjoyed grazing after a soft rain. Yet the storm hadn't quite passed us yet, and I fell into this muddy ditch. Brutus came slipping and sliding right behind me. His leg got caught by this gnarly, thorny branch and he let out this yelp that pierced the rain. I got up and tried to help him, but it was like attempting to wrangle a fish as it flopped from the water. Brutus was confused, terrified, struggling so much that it was only making his pain worse with each passing moment. We couldn't seem to pull him free. I told my brother to go get our dad, try to find a rope, and we could perhaps snag the branch up and free Brutus. Meanwhile, he continued to whine and yelp, the thorns digging into his leg muscles the more he fought against the snare. Ain't no way to move that branch. It's too muddy. I don't have any good equipment, Dad told us when he assessed the situation. He told us to leave Brutus there, and he would figure it out. But he didn't. Instead... As my brother and I went home, I could hear my dog's shrieks echo across the night air. The sound of suffering. Endless pain. And, with each new yelp, it became worse. The sounds across the airwaves of Mars reminded me of my dog, and how he died that night, caught in the mud. I was helpless to save him. As helpless as I was to find out the truth about these recordings. I pulled up the location data from the rover to give me an idea of where the shriek had come from. Near one of the many wide craters that we have been studying in search for Martian water, I realized. The data was still being transmitted and it told me that the final compiling would come in in the morning. It was difficult to wait but I knew that there wouldn't be many more answers coming that night. 
still intrigued by the noises I heard, I decided to pull audio files from the surrounding area for the past week and see if I could determine any clues. It resulted in a lack of sleep, and even less answers. As I pieced together the audio on my home desktop, I noticed that a pattern emerged. The screams were there, every so often amid the data. But they were moving. I pulled out a map of the Martian landscape and began to chart a course where I heard them. As the rover moved and surveyed the area, the noise would sound as though it was following the river. Was there a possibility something was alive on the Martian world and watching our rover? The painful and anguished screams haunted my dreams. It sounded worse and worse with each new recording I found. Hearing the silence and the low, thrumming soil of Mars in between the unexpected shrieks was a blessing. My tired brain told me there was more to it. But I had to sleep. And, of course, nightmares came when I did. I saw cities that didn't have shape metropolitan areas on Mars from ancient times. It reminded me of the old science fiction stories from the 20s, an entire civilization living under the ice. In the dream, something crashed on the surface of the planet, something from a world unlike any we had ever encountered. The dream didn't offer it any shape or form. It was just this abomination of noise that was surrounding the entire landscape. The Martians ran and shrieked, the formless creatures mimicking their suffering and spreading its awful noise everywhere. The ground shook and swallowed them all up, leaving behind only vibrations. I woke the next day in a cold sweat. It felt like that same noise had permeated my skin. I wanted so desperately to find out what was happening on the red planet, so I got to work and immediately checked the other rovers to see if they picked up mysterious signals. I just wanted my dream to be nothing more than my fragile imagination. But, as I reviewed the traces of data we had collected... I saw disturbing evidence of something within the soil where the rover had surveyed. Microorganisms. Bacterial life that can exist anywhere in the universe. It was migrating to the ground and following the rover. I began to check other data, photographs and videos from the area that had been downloaded and properly cleaned. Yet, I found nothing. No evidence of a life from near to the area. Or at least, not one visible. As much as I hated to do it, I decided to present the data to my manager. I figured they could keep things under control and perhaps alleviate some of the worry I had. These screams were troubling me, making me lose sleep, and I wanted to find a scientific solution that wouldn't terrify me. She promised to review the data, but the next day when I asked about it, she acted like I had made the whole thing up. That has already been processed and catalogued. I want you to focus on the other findings from the crater, she insisted. When I returned to my research, though, I found copies of the audio files on my computer, which confirmed that I had truly heard these noises. So, why was she denying their existence? I tried to move them offline again to have someone outside of our facility review the data, but soon found that the information was now heavily secured. Someone didn't want this to get out, my close friend Stephen told me. I showed him the chart of the Martian landscape that I've been reviewing and he began to trace a pattern from where the different noises had come from. And each time you said that it's a high pitch noise, yeah? He asked. I nodded, and he told me something that should have been plainly obvious. This thing... It's getting closer. 
and closer. Each time you record it, the pitch is decreasing. The wavelengths are traveling to you slower and slower as well. In other words, something may have gone terribly wrong on the surface of Mars, and we don't even know about it yet. Do you believe it could be something dangerous? I asked. What are the samples shown? I reviewed them again. The sudden findings of life that I had recorded were now gone, erased completely. Rewinding that trace data showed a shocking result. When the noise came, the bacterial life forms would shrivel as a result. These screams were acting as a pestilence on the Martian world. The next nightmare I had was more vivid. The extraterrestrial parasite which had crashed on the planet was now infecting the ground. I saw a lush and vibrant Mars transform into the wasteland we knew so well. The civilization that named the planet home was killed in only a matter of weeks, and then the virus ate them alive, devouring every part of their body and possibly even their souls. I saw the invisible effects of the screams on the planet everywhere I looked in my dream. Scars that ran deep into the red core revealed wounds of dead soil. Dangerous, invisible parasites that eagerly cling to any life that passes by. Suddenly, I felt my legs slipping into the crimson soil, being pulled under. Dragged down to this Martian hell, I found myself scraping and gasping for breath as dirt and soil was spilling into my throat, and I was drowning on this alien world. I woke up, gasping and unable to breathe, and I ran to the bathroom and began to vomit. What came out of my lungs were particles of sand and red soil. I looked down at my body, astonished to find that I was covered in the color of Mars from head to toe. Swiftly, I bathed and shook away the nightmare, disturbed by this sudden telepathic connection I had with the planet. Was it because of the infectious noise that I had heard? Was it trying to eat me alive the same way it had the old Martians? I tried again to tell my supervisors of the potential threat, But instead of listening, she informed me that I was going to be relocated to a different apartment. There was evidence that you attempted to retrieve secured audio files recently and share them, which goes against our policy. You are lucky to have a job at all, she told me. I was astounded at the sudden change in attitude, her behavior seemingly hostile when I brought up the recordings. I'll have the rest of the team review them, but I'm afraid I will have to ask you to clear out your desk and leave by the end of the day. I did as I was told, but not before I created a small backdoor program to get into their network. It didn't take long, but I was certain that monitoring the noises would be smart for the future. Once I finished, I left for lunch and started to download the files to my laptop. Stephen assisted me with it, but told me that most of the files now seemed corrupted. I think your bosses are doing this on purpose, he said. Yeah, I think it might be that this noise is affecting them subconsciously, I admitted, as I fidgeted nervously with my fork. Have you tried to play the audio backwards? He asked casually. The thought hadn't even occurred to me. Are you saying it'll be like a secret code or something? I joked. No, but you know, it could reveal something about the samples we're missing, he told me. As we experimented with the corrupted audio again, I heard distortions and shrieks again, and he immediately became tense. Jesus... That's a nightmare, he whispered nervously. 
His hair was standing up on his arm as we kept listening, and I commented, It gets louder every time the rover is obtaining samples. So, the samples that are transmitting data here are transferring whatever this is to Earth? He asked. Neither of us knew what to make of that implication, but he requested to review the data and try to hack it that evening. So I let him. I called my boss that evening, begging her to listen to reason. Something about all of this was very, very wrong. You need to step out of the way of progress. These samples will show us how the entire planet of Mars has evolved into the Eden it is today. An Eden... Huh. Are we... are we talking about the same planet? I asked with a soft laugh, but she didn't appreciate the joke. Her tone was serious. What the planet is offering to our world is greater than anything you can imagine. Terraforming an entire world into a perfect environment. It would be a miracle for Earth, she whispered. I found myself suddenly uneasy talking to her. But the planet of Mars is dead. We've seen that it's deteriorating, perhaps even dying. How is that a blessing for us? The silence over the next few moments was ominous. Death is the only consistency in the universe. Life sprung from nothing eons ago. It is inevitable that one day it will all be snuffed out. Our time here is for one purpose alone. To serve as fuel for the next cycle. What? Um, what are you talking about? Then I heard this low thrill behind her as she kept speaking. It is our very existence that is the problem. Life is meant only to feed death. And death... Death is eternal. Perfect. Beautiful. Michelle... Do you hear that? I whispered becoming terrified by the conversation. She sounded possessed. It sounded like the winds of Mars were bristling through her lungs. It is the warning of the future we must prepare for. The inevitable transformation of our own world. My mouth felt dry. These samples that have been taken from the craters. What exactly happens to them? I ask. I think you know the answer to that. They come here. They will find their way to our world one way or another, she whispered. The noise in the background was making my ears feel like they were bleeding. Surrender to evolution... Death is the ultimate phase of all life. I hung up the phone and frantically called Stephen, hoping that he was available. Yet I got no answer. I grabbed my keys and decided to race to his house. These recordings were more than just a peculiarity. They were a threat to our world. I tried to knock on his door, but there was no response. I shouted for his attention, yet instead I heard that same shrill noise. It made me want to cover my ears and get into a fetal position. I pulled myself up and found a window I could crawl into. Inside his small one-bedroom house, the noise was deafening. My eardrums felt like they could burst as I stuffed wads of paper to soften the intense screams. Then, I found Stephen, mutilated in his living room. 
it was clear the injuries were self-inflicted. They had taken one of his kitchen knives and sliced off his ears first, stuffing them into his mouth. Then they had sliced his wrists and let the blood drain out on his couch. Finally, even as his life ebbed away, it appeared that he had carved open his stomach, letting his guts hang out and dangle on the carpet. Somehow, despite all of this madness, I saw that my friend had typed a message on his laptop. A warning. They are listening. I found myself wanting to pick up that same blade and harm myself. This invisible voice was urging me to kill. To let death take over my useless body. The blade touched my own neck, cutting into my flesh as I struggled to escape the screams. I managed to get out before I was overwhelmed by that desire. As I drove home, my boss called me again. I panicked and sent it to voicemail. When I later checked the recording, all I heard was the same howling. Slow, methodical, shrill noises. That told me the strange, invisible threat I had heard was now here. I made it home, hardly able to think straight or even focus. Then, I managed to compose this warning for others. I have realized that the concerns Stephen had were even more serious than we first understood. The dangerous, invisible evil is already on its way here. And worst of all, it may already be too late to stop it. You've been listening to The Winds of Mars by author Kyle Harrison. Kyle Harrison is a prolific horror author with over 600 short stories under his belt, including five that were contest winners and runners-up, including the viral sensation The 24-Hour Game. Harrison's work has been published in over 20 anthologies and helps indie publishers to get their books out on the market. In his spare time, when he's not scaring people to death, he works in the transportation department at a Texas school. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. If you'd like to hear more lengthy tales, be sure to take a look at my audiobooks, available now on audible.com. If you'd like to hear a premium, ad-free edition of tonight's and all our other episodes, Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks so much for your time and for giving our sponsors a try today. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. And that also means a lot to me. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. 
You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another Dance with Darkness. I bet you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. You've been listening to Horror Hill, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, as well as a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill, unless otherwise noted. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Sound design, original music, and final mixing and mastering provided by Felipe Ojeda under the guidance of executive producer and director Craig Groshek. The program's logo was created by Craig Groshek, and this week's artwork provided by Omega Black, unless otherwise noted. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at horrorhill at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of the show. If you enjoyed what you've heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and Horror Hill on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. If you can never get enough spooky stories and can't wait until next week for more, and haven't already, be sure to check out Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on YouTube for hundreds of free audio horror stories, including more performances from yours truly, and consider supporting us by becoming a patron at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more frightening fiction to haunt your dreams. Until next time, I'm Jason Hill, and you've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast. Good evening, and sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.